tonight's talk is uh, going to be really fascinating. I think we have two great people here, uh, Martha, Ernest. Um, collectively, I think they have a very interesting perspective on play, which, as you guys will slowly kind of understand as they talk about it, they'll, they'll discuss a little bit about their work, um, some of the stuff they've done together in the past, and just all in all, it'll be a very like, organic dialogue. So first off, I'm going to start with having um, maybe Ernest speak a little bit of himself. Um, he's going to have some work that's going to come up right away here. Uh, and then from there, we can jump into Martha and then talk a little bit about their, their background. And then at the end, um, we're going to have a little bit of Q&A, so maybe if you guys want to prepare some questions, uh, I'll come on the crowd and you guys can ask some questions. Hey guys, good Hi everybody. I can't see you, so it's kind of weird. But, uh, <laughs> All right, so my name is Ernest. I don't know how many of you know my work and myself, but um, it's nice to see a nice crowd here. Um, I put together a little presentation with slides of my work, just for those who are not very aware of it. And uh, yeah, it's not what I expected to start from, but <laughs> it's a good start. Anyway, so uh, there's going to be some work rolling in the background as I talk. So I'm from Lithuania, and uh, I grew up there, lived there, my parents are still there, and uh, I, uh, I was studying art since I was very little, sort of. I grew up in the, um, my dad was a painter, so I learned a lot from him, even though he hadn't practiced when I was growing up, he got away getting busy with uh, family stuff. Uh, but they sent, my parents sent me off to art school and I was practicing traditional oil painting there for a couple of years, uh, uh, seven years actually. And then uh, I had a lot of uh, friends who got me involved into graffiti. And so besides my art curriculum, I was doing a lot of work on the side in the street and, uh, and in the studio because um, our curriculum at the school was very sort of strict. Can I just ask you a question real quick? Growing up in Lithuania, what was your perspective on street art? Um, that's a funny question. So uh, I grew up in the... Uh, technically, I was born in the Soviet Union, so we had very cut... Uh, you know, very st strong border with Western culture. So in 1990s, that uh, when the border broke, we sort of had this flood of uh, influence. You know, flood of a culture, and we had the like, hip hop and graffiti and b boys coming in. With all this, uh, you know, on TV and everything, which we were not aware and exposed to before. So as a kid, it was a very exciting moment. You know, just having this entirely new culture, which is so creative, so exciting, and so dynamic. So exploring that, you know, I was, uh, uh, ever since I was probably 10 years old, you know, I was really like watching music videos with the B-Boys and trying to doodle in my notebooks and stuff like that. Um, but besides that, um, it sort of gave a good background of very mixed influence culture. Um, people who were practicing a lot of like poster art, a lot of uh, traditional art, uh, mixed media, oil paintings, uh, discovered this whole new world of graffiti and started going out in the streets. So I think it has like very specific flavor to it, uh, what happens in the street in Lithuania and Eastern Europe, you know, compared to uh, everything west from Germany. Yeah, yeah that's, that's really fascinating. Um, Martha, do you want to maybe give a little bit of background on, on yourself? Um, Why don't or? we wait till I show my slideshow. Okay. Uh, yeah, it's... Because uh, I put uh, that in there. I'm just going to yeah, finish off with uh, where way it led me to. So after, after my high school, I moved to London and studied there for a while. And that got me into the whole street art scene. Uh, you know, being in London in 2008 with all the Banksy phenomena, with all the exciting things happening, you know, um, was really exciting to see that another new culture. And, uh, and sort of after a while, I got just fed up of living in London, not, not the culture that much, but living in there as, as being in a metropolis, I moved on to traveling, and that brought me to Penang. But most of the works we see here is um, from Malaysia, where I'm currently still based, my studio is still based there. And I was there since 2010. Um, it got me into, uh, I got into uh, Georgetown Festival, where I did my first extensive series of street art which was six pieces across the town, various locations, various scale, different sizes. And that sort of got me a lot of online exposure, which got me into, into the whole traveling street art scene and going around the world and meeting all of you guys. And that's, that's where me and Martin yeah. met. 
Is there a reason why you decided to stay or base yourself in Penang? Uh, it was just the right place at the right time for me, I think. Um, it was, uh, I don't know, it was a new environment, a uh, new place. I sort of have given up everything I had before, you know, like uh, I left my apartment, my studies, everything back in London. I really didn't knew where I'm going. So having um, a fresh start of everything sort of got me into a routine where I did whatever I wanted to do and that ended up being a full-time practice for the first time in my life with no distractions, with part-time jobs, with no studies, with nothing behind that. Um, and that sort of that kept me in the place. Yeah. I think you should, in case you don't know Ernest Ward, the birds are painted. And uh, the man is trying to figure. <laughs> Thank you, Martha. I think those are real birds, but yeah. those are not real birds. Thank you, Martha, for <laughs> explanation. Yeah, that's a funny piece out in Barcelona I did years ago. The funniest story about it, because besides people, people being really confused uh, what's going on, that it's uh, that Barcelona is really strict about graffiti, but this piece we kind of. Uh, you know, all of the other pieces I did at the same trip, uh, we sort of buffed out within two days. And this one stayed, and it's it's still there. It's been two yeah, years. I saw it there last It's year. been two years, and it's still there, and they kind of buff around it. And people come, uh, uh, because there's Montana store just nearby, so everyone keeps tagging and putting their own stencils and stuff around. And council keeps buffing that out. But yeah, it's, uh, sort of a, it's a living piece there. Uh, all right, why don't we just pass it on to Marta? That's and, it? Um, For your pictures? <laughs> I don't know, it's, it's kind of rolling it's slow. Be it's rolling slower than I expected. Uh, and um, in a different order, but anyhow. Um, so this picture is interesting because it leads to, to the New Art Festival, which we just done uh, last year. Both me and Marta participated in the festival, and that was my indoor installation. Uh, New Art Festival in, uh, in Norway, they always invite artists to do indoors and outdoor installation, which is kind of very interesting dynamic. It sounds funky, but they only do it because it rains half of the time outside, so people <laughs> spend time indoors doing installations. And um, that was the first ever street art festival that I, which I did under the invitation from New York. And that was an exciting experience. That's where I met Marta. That's where we met again last year because the first time we met was in 2013. And um, yeah, so ever since it sort of opened up the whole new dynamics of the street art festivals and, uh, and the whole this scene and the culture. And um, I knew Marta's work before, I didn't know much about Marta. But uh, when we met in Norway, that sort of was very, uh, yeah, very inspirational sort of meaning because that, uh, that's, uh, that's also in Norway at the same festival this year. We were looking for a picture. We have a picture of me and Marta next to that wall, but we couldn't find it. And uh, that's the same festival. But yeah, that was uh, that was an interesting point in my life because uh, that opened up the whole new the whole new scene and the whole new world of the street art as a, as a contemporary culture, not as the um, very much underground graffiti culture which I knew before. And um, I think. Um, I think we can pass it on to Marta now, and uh, she can give a bit of more, more background about her work and, uh, and our story and what we do together. Okay, I can try. <laughs> All right, can we get my slides up here? Is that possible? She's going to pull it up. Sorry. She. Okay. So, I was born in Baltimore, Maryland, which as probably most of you know, is about four hours south of New York City by car. And my dad had a camera store. This is a picture of him. And I had a camera when I was in nursery school. So this is me with a camera in nursery school. That was a camera. It was called a baby brownie. Um, roll film, of course. Completely impossible for a child to load. And, but, <laughs> Well, I have, you know, par my parents would have to load it, and there were only like eight frames on the film. And my father used to take me on what he called camera runs. So this is a picture of me at the Baltimore Harbor on a camera run. And the idea was that we would go out looking for pictures. And in fact, to this day, that's exactly what I like to do. And most of my pictures are either, they're now called street photography, 
but I'm, I basically go out looking for pictures. Next. Okay, so here's a picture. Now we're in high school, me and my cousin Sally, and you can see that we have really sophisticated cameras because since my father had a camera store, he could supply us with uh, the latest models. Uh, still, they were all, you know, nothing automatic about these cameras. Um, we're taking, a, this is at summer camp, we're taking pictures of each other. So, throughout my entire life, I've always had a camera and taken pictures. Next. And Sally is sitting here in the audience. <laughs> Sally's here with me in Long Beach. Um, so, we're fast forwarding a little bit. Uh, when I, I studied art, not photography, in college. I majored in art. And when I graduated, President Kennedy had just started the Peace Corps. So I signed right up. And I went to Thailand to teach English. And after the two years uh, were over, instead of, we had the choice of taking uh, $500 or a plane ticket. And I took the $500 and I bought a motorcycle and I drove it across Asia. So this was me, the picture on the left, I'm in Afghanistan. And uh, the picture on the right is a picture I took then. This is 1965 in Afghanistan of a little boy with um, a hoop. And I liked this hoop so much that I actually bought it from this child and carried it on my motorcycle and I still have it. I have this uh, and, and the, the little stick that he was using. So even though I hadn't sort of formulated anything about what kind of photography I wanted to do, uh, when I look at my old pictures, I can see that I was interested in children at play. Um, okay, next. So um, I decided I wanted to be a photographer, and I didn't really know what kind of photography, but I moved to New York City in 1975 with the idea that I would be a newspaper photographer. And I got a job with the New York Post, and at the time, you can see, there were, I was the only woman photographer. It was actually quite unusual to have female newspaper photographers, although that is not the case today. And one of the things that we had to do uh, was when we weren't on assignment, we needed to take pictures that they called weather shots. And these weather shots were if it was hot or cold or rainy or windy. And um, I used to, the post was on the Lower East Side of Manhattan, which now is the trendy East Village. But then it was a, a bunch of abandoned buildings. And I used to drive through this uh, area called um, Alphabet City, Avenues A, B, C, and D, just looking for pictures. And I started looking for pictures of kids. That's a picture of me um, with some of the kids. Okay, next. And I began taking these pictures. Uh, actually, this was not on the Lower East Side. And um, next, after this, this is a, just an example, a miscellaneous example of a weather shot. And while I was on vacation, from the post, I went to Haiti. And I saw kids making their own toys. And I decided that when I got back to New York, I would look for that, with that idea. So, next. Uh, another picture of Haiti, okay, next. Again, so these are, you can see, really creative kids uh, who were playing with things that they made themselves. Next. Okay, so here when I got back to, the, to New York, uh, again, still driving through the same neighborhoods, uh, I began to take these pictures. And this, in fact, is one of the photos that Ernest and I have been working with, and you'll see an example of that later. Uh, next. So just here, you can do it like just a series of these black and white pictures. Next. So these are examples, kids. This was on the old West Side Highway, which has been torn down. Was it difficult for you to find these types of photos, do you think, back um, in the day? Or was it, you know, just through regular you know, walking you around? Know, just remember, I was out there with my cameras every day. Every day I had to go back to the post we were developed. It was film. We had to develop a film. I had two cameras. Uh, I often had lots of film left over. If I didn't use up the film, uh, we would just throw it away because we pulled the, the film out of the camera and we develop it. 
and uh, we, we wouldn't make any attempt to save any unused film. So um, it was difficult to find the really good pictures, <laughs> uh, but it wasn't difficult to find kids playing outdoors by themselves, uh, very accessible, uh, not a lot of parental guardians around, so I didn't really have to ask permission. I, I know I asked you this before, but over the course of the years, how did you end up cataloging like all your photos? I'm sure you've taken thousands upon thousands of photos. Do you have like a system? <laughs> I have a system, but it's not really a good system. Uh, I mean, these pictures are negatives. I, I mean, what I, these pictures actually belong to the Post. When I left the Post, um, I went through the archives, and because I had taken them not on assignment, I decided that I owned them whether or not I did, and I took them. Uh, and I'm really glad that I did. <laughs> because they would have thrown them all out. I mean, I heard that they did throw out all the negatives, and so these negatives are in, like, negative sleeves, and they're, no, they're not well cataloged. I don't have a good system, but I, but I, I can retrieve them, but unfortunately nobody else can, so I need to work on that. I need to work on that. Okay, so, um, next. I mean, and this, this is the kind of thing that I really love because here they're, these kids are taking apart a baby crib and turning it into guns to play with. And so you can see that the child on the left, it's, he's testing it and in his mind, you can see that that, that bar from the, that rung of a baby crib has already turned into a gun. And again, this is a picture that you will, the next phase of, of this picture is one that Ernest and I have worked with, of the child with using the gun. But, I mean, I was interested in seeing how much imagination they had that they could take just the baby crib and turn it into a gun. Okay, next. Um, pigeons were, uh, many, many children had pigeon coops on the roofs or in the windows. Next. And so this, this boy was drawing uh, graffiti on the street with chalk. Uh, he was writing Al. But in fact, at the time, I didn't really understand why he was writing Al. Um, but next. However, this boy, and we're kind of sitting in front of this picture, which is, is an important picture. Um, he showed me his notebook. And in his notebook, he, his, his nickname was He Three. And he explained to me that he was practicing uh, to writing his name so that he could write it on a wall. And you can see it says He Three. And up until that time, I really had no idea. Um, of course, there was a lot of graffiti, but I had no idea what it was that I was reading because it never really made any sense. You would see collections of letters, des or does or days. But it didn't seem to say anything. And so I hadn't, it hadn't really penetrated into my consciousness. But this was sort of like the Rosetta Stone of graffiti for me. As soon as he explained it to me, I, I thought, oh, oh, you know, now I understand. That's what I've been seeing. Like the boy writing Owl on the street, Owl must have been his nickname. And Were you ever able to continue like a, like a relationship with him? Like, did you ever know what happened to him down the I line? I do. I do. I'm still in touch with him. Uh, unfortunately, he has been in jail. Well, he's out now, but he was in jail for 15 years. And he still lives in New York. And he still lives on the Lower East Side. And I actually have a picture of him uh, all grown up next to that wall. Not with me, though. So. Um, so he... He three, he said, um, because I expressed interest, he said, well, I can introduce you to a king. And of course, that sounded interesting. And uh, I had a car, so he hopped in my car, and we drove out to East New York, and he introduced me to Dandi. Dandi was the king. And so he, this Edwin, his name is Edwin, played a really important role in my life. And then I was invited uh, back again. By, I mean, I talked to Dandi. That's a picture of me interviewing Dandi. Um, I took a friend with me. We're in Dandi's basement, but that was my second visit. Anyway, next. Oh, oh, I should just say, and that's, that's he three, he flew pigeons mm. on a roof. So uh, my first connection with him was pigeon flying. Mm. So when I first met Dandi, he immediately recognized my name 
because he had clipped this piece from the New York Post, one of these weather pictures, and pasted it in the front of his black book. And it had my name on it. So he knew I wasn't a cop. And the reason he had done it was that CIA was his crew, and this was a throw up that he had done. And, he, and that just floored me because I had taken this picture of a little girl because she was on a rope, handmade rope swing. I hadn't really noticed the graffiti in the background, and the idea that somebody could claim what to me just seemed like a random scrawl uh, was, it was, you know, I just had never even begun to think that these were identifiable scribbles. And of course, after that, I really began to look at them more carefully. Um, next, I think I have one or two, okay. So then Gandhi invited me to come and spend the day with him and his friends as they drew in their black books. And what I like about this picture is that he's holding a photo album and it's all of his photos of graffiti. And I think the reason that I was so accepted uh, into the community was that I could take much better pictures, but photography was always an important part of graffiti. Because if you didn't have a picture, you couldn't prove. So if you're writing on a train, uh, you wouldn't have the proof that you had done that. And Dandi told me that really he didn't want to uh, go out and do a piece on a train unless he had a camera. And of course the only camera that he would get would be a disposable camera from you know, the drugstore. So I was able to fit into the culture by providing, I always gave back photographs. Um, next. And so I just wanted to say that I'm still, I'm, I'm always interested in play wherever I find it. And, and graffiti culture had a lot of play in it. I mean, this wasn't spending a night in the yards, but it wasn't simply just uh, writing graffiti. It was also like hanging from the straps. Next. You know, or here's a boy running across the train. So to me, these are all part of the same idea of kids um, being creative about how they're playing. Next. And I'm still interested here, this is the Fumakaka crew. I'm interested in all kinds of inventions by, you know, whomever is doing it. This is, um, instead of like a fire extinguisher, this is an ex a um, spray that you can pump with a bicycle pump. Whereas a fire extinguisher, of course, you need like compressed air. And you can see the little, they have a how-to uh, booklet that they've put out, and it's extremely playful. The graffiti is playful, the, the way they do it is playful, the booklet describing it is playful, and I still, you know, love to see these kinds of things and photograph them. Next. Maybe I'm going on too long. Maybe this is the last one. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. So, for, for example, here's Katsu with a drone that he's managed to attach a spray can to. I mean, I'm, I'm very interested in kids, youth, people being inventive in their everyday life. Um, next. I'm not sure there is a next. Oh, yeah. Okay. Finally, this is the last one. <laughs> this is graffiti in Sao Paulo um, where kids have thrown uh, eggs full of paint onto the wall. So. <laughs> Very playful. Okay. So, so maybe next up, we, we can so, yeah. talk a little bit about your guys' collaboration, yeah. the work you guys have done together. I, I believe there's a, there's a series of images that pertain to that. that are going to so let's just, up. yeah, let's just roll those images with, like, the next batch. Not this one. Yeah. So, so maybe I'll introduce uh, quickly a project, what we're going to be talking about, right? So ever, ever since we met in, the, in Norway, and how we met was very interesting, right? So I was working in my installation, and uh, that was just a room full of mess. That was the half of a car in the room, and some random paintings of mine, and Marta was like, Ernest, you gotta see something, right? So then she introduced me into her street playbook and showed me key free images and stuff. And back then we said like, all right, you know, one day we gotta do something together. We didn't know what, we didn't know how it's gonna come up, where it's going to go. What was your initial reaction when you like started leaking through her book and seeing her art? Like, how did you feel? Uh, that was quite insane. You know, I knew her work from her graffiti photography, from subway art. 
Um, and um, but I have not idea of uh, I have not have any idea about, about Marta's background as a more well, anthropological photographer. And um, and we just find that our subjects, you know, are very much similar. And um, my reference images and the images that she took back in the day, you know, they they very much in the same sort of uh, point of interest where it's you know just kids being creative and being playful and uh, and exploring this child's, child's imagination in the, in the images uh, was kind of uh, was uh, interesting to see because you know some of the images of from Marta from New York in the 70s and some of the images of mine are from Penang currently and uh, and they're so similar in the vibe and the, and the, what it feels like and sort of it's uh, it shows us you know like uh, kind of universal feeling about uh, what we explore. What about you, Martha? What was your initial reaction when you saw Ernest's work? Yeah, I mean, I loved absolutely loved it the first time I saw it and um, I felt an immediate connection. Like, oh, he really sees the same thing in these kids that I do, which is it's not simply kids playing. It's kids being imaginative, kids being creative, kids inventing things, and his work is also very inventive. So he played off of what the kids were doing, and I mean, I don't think he gave good descriptions of some of his work. I don't think you could actually see how, would you how clever. It's just incredibly clever, and you all have to see the wall that he's painted here. Some of you have, and I mean, I don't want to, no spoilers, but it's it's really clever, and it's it's got some like Trump oil. It's 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 hard to figure out. It's sometimes you can't tell exactly which is real, like like the bird picture. So I, what? Where is your wall, Ernest? Tell them the address. Um, my wall is on Six and Elm. Uh, yeah, it's, it's a, a three-story building next to the car park. Um, but yeah, I guess what Marta is trying to say that sort of. Uh, my approach to my work is uh, it's kind of similar to approach of these kids playing their things and trying to build stuff out of stuff. I never really know where I'm gonna end up starting my work. It just it's just a process of play really. And um, so this this wall as well was a similar situation. I spent a week looking at the wall before I knew what's gonna happen. So so these images that we're looking at right here, um, what, what exactly are they from? Which project? Uh, so, so last year in, the, in Norway, we said, uh, uh, we met again, and uh, we were very happy to see each other. And I was like, uh, I was saying, you know, Mart, I'm coming to New York. Let's come and play. Yeah. <laughs> Basically, that was it. Uh, that was no idea what it's going to be like and where we're going to end up. I said, uh, I love your work, you love my work. We definitely could do something together. And um, so I ring her up when I'm in New York. We sit down and we go you know, through, through it and say, so, where it's going to start? Yeah, uh, so, it's actually Miami. But, um, yeah, that's, uh, that's where it ended up. Um, so we decided to do, I, I had a, I've been carrying that idea for years, to, to have Marta's images as a reference, and do my spin of my street pieces, and bring it back to New York, to originally where we've come from, um, the, initially inspired by the book, The Street, street Playbook, so I wanted to bring the same vibe, same images uh, in my work back to the streets of New York, trying to attempt to similar locations where we were shot and, uh, and work with Marta on curating it and the placement. Yeah, how did you guys go about choosing photos? Because I'm sure she has tons of photos you guys had to go through. Uh, she sent me a thousand images, I sent her back a hundred images, she <laughs> sent me back a twenty images. <laughs> So what were you looking for in your images? Um, Did you have like a particular thing in mind that you wanted to, or that you were like drawn to? I think for me it was very straightforward. I was looking for a very, uh, a, a bit dry technical bit, because um, my initial selection was the, the first hundred batch was the images which are from the site with objects in them. Um, uh, funny enough, uh, so sort of the images which I look for in my archives because uh, how I work, I just have tons and tons of photographs and I go through thousands of images selecting a few which I think could work on a painting. So I did the same process for Marta's images and then we sit down looking at these hundred images with Marta saying, all right, so what works here? And, uh, oh, and don't, don't change this one. 
don't, don't change this one quite yet. Um, do you want to say something about this? Yeah, I mean, I, just because I want everybody to understand that often when you're looking at Ernest's um, interpretations, he's put something like real in there, and maybe you can't even tell, but the the carriage is a, an actual carriage that's been sliced in half and put onto the wall. So I mean, it looks, but the but the the cloth part is painted, correct? Um, some yeah. of it, some yeah. of it is some of it, some is real, some is painted. Look closely. That's what, and and in many of those, that's the case. I don't think you would be able to tell. That. So so my idea of the objects in the image is just kind of you know bringing in a sort of part of something real into something what is fictional. But the the most realist thing about about this wall, I think. Uh, I passed this wall in Bushwick and I just saw the tags and I, and I just felt like it's very much like New York and it has similar vibes with uh, uh, sort of um, what you could feel from Marta's images. And uh, so I went into the barber shop and asked if they own the building, if I could use a wall. And sort of uh, we got the permission for that, but I had no idea what's going to go on there. I just like the textures and I like the tag. So the next day I show up and I sit there with my camera and thinking, what it's going to be off, and I, I couldn't figure out what image and uh, what I sent the image of the wall to Martha saying, "Oh, Martha, we got a wall." But um, and then that was a uh, and then the um, daycare school break, right? Apparently, there are a lot of daycare schools around there, and around from one o'clock till three p.m., uh, there's a bunch of babies, bunch of families with. Uh, with baby cards, right, just rolling past, and uh, that was sort of no-brainer, you know. So, so I, I got back to Martha the bathroom, and saying, like, Martha, we got to do this, and, and she was like, how come? But I, I just told her the whole thing about all the, you know, all the families passing by, them, and that being actual a real subject, you know, in the street, you know, what people actually see. It. So I think that part of the the real element, I think, for me, I found it even more important. And what what I bring it with the uh, with the objects is just like a little bit of that uh, attention, which I want people to think and consider in my work. You know, try just try and consider which part is real, which is not, and then you know, look around in the environment and look for these things, what they see in my work. So, yeah. This is a question for you, Martha. Do you feel that Ernest has kind of create a second life to your photos because otherwise it might have been hard to see this photo um, in your archives or whatnot but now he's brought it to the real world yeah very well put um, this was never one of my favorite photos yeah I liked it all right but it wasn't like a special photo that I ever would have picked out so when he initially told me he was gonna work on that one you know I'm like yeah he said why you know I wasn't sure why he would pick that one but of course now I love it you know, now it is one of my favorite photos. Yeah. We can go to the next photo. Okay. Yeah, so the, that's one of Amorita's, I think, iconic images that she has in the book, in the street play book. Uh, and that just got, got stuck with me. I, I could not I could not leave that one out. I sort of thought it's going to go somewhere, but I couldn't, as well, I couldn't imagine where. And then we got... Um, we got this wall arranged in the um, Wyckoff Hospital, and uh, and the owner was saying, you know, like, so that wall was this red brick wall along the side of the road, and there was just nothing I could think of for there. You know, it was a massive wall, very long, nothing to do with our work and what our work feels like, and nothing what I was looking for. But well, I went around the block, and I found this dumpster behind there, uh, and I was like, how about I do a painting there? The owner was like, <laughs> Um, confused by it um, because they do offer it as a massive wall spot, but they were fine with it. Uh, but because of this fence and the and the perspective and then how it was laid out, uh, it uh, just really got my first attention. And then uh, later, when I was figuring out the compositions of the piece and stuff, I was I was talking to the local tenants across the street, and apparently this block, the whole block that the hospital is built, was a. Uh, um, nine-story building uh, less than 10 years ago which uh, which collapsed and that's kind of a very significant moment in the neighborhood as well because everyone everyone lives there everyone knows the area and that was the moment that uh, wake up was really uh, Bushwick really changing in new york 
So I think just having sort of the same background of the areas which uh, develop and change and get gentrified, get, uh, you know, they relive their lives sort of, which you see in the uh, East Manhattan back in 70s and then uh, spreading it across New York all the way to. What's the significance of this photo to you, Martha? Of, of the original photo? Yeah, of the original. Uh, I mean, remember, this is the Lower East Side. Look at those buildings. I mean, these buildings were, they, it looked like a war zone. And it's hard to imagine if you go to New York now and you go to this area that it ever looked like this. So uh, this is a moment in time. It's like, but on the other hand, you have these kids that were allowed to freedom to play. I mean, I don't think you're going to find a little girl playing out in a vacant lot um, with a lot of trash around, climbing a fence without parental supervision now in New York. And not, not just because um, she might fall down, but because there might be uh, needles, uh, contaminated needles in the lot. I mean, there's, there's just a lot more fear about kids playing alone. And um, yeah, maybe you guys should talk a little bit about your guys' childhood growing up and what is what was playing to you guys? Like, what would what'd you do when you were young? Yeah, I mean, I had a childhood where I was free to do anything I wanted just as long as I came home for dinner. And I could go out and play, and um, yeah, Sally and I were talking about that. We, our parents didn't know where we were. We did not have cell phones where they could contact us, but they just uh, weren't worried. I, I grew up in Baltimore, a city. It wasn't the country or anything. But there were uh, little wooded areas and things. I mean, we built playhouses and things. And so, I mean, I think a lot of my interest in play relates to my own childhood about being free. And these kids are free to play uh, wherever they want. And I, I think that has changed. What about yourself, Ernest? Uh, I think uh, from this perspective, uh, I have pretty similar background. And uh, I was pretty much free. I was out there doing my things. Nobody really cared or supervised us. Uh, as long as I'm like sort of a... Uh, if I can hear my mom shouting for lunch, um, I'm still good, right? If I cannot, it maybe it's a bit getting far. And that's the talking that I was probably four or five. And um, you don't see that that often now. And um, yeah, times change, uh, situations change, cultures change. And uh, but we definitely, I think, both me and Marta, we had a bit more freedom growing up as uh, as kids. And. Uh, just being, you know, like managing your own time and innovating and being innovative about how you play and what you play rather than being given toys and being told how to. Uh, I think changes, you know, perception a lot. Um, you don't see that often anymore. Um, Do you guys ever think back on your childhood about, you know, your guys' freedom and how it pertains to your work now? Is there any sort of like things that inspire you from your youth? I don't really think about it, but <laughs> yeah, I think there are, you know, it just, they're, they're built in. Uh, I think it's uh, it's easier to notice if we would talk about each other, you know, like uh, how Martha's father, Martha's dad being, owning a camera shop and, you know, like, and her exposure to the, to the media, medium, you know, and uh, her being a journalist before it all grows into this background, which we see now, but it's, I think on yourself, it's quite hard to judge. Uh, elements like that. And we should say this. This is the this is the baby rung that the crib that has become the gun, and that's Ernest's version. Yeah. So that was inspired directly by the image and by the you know by the use of the baby crib into a gun. Uh, it was in Brooklyn where I stayed in New York last year, and. Uh, Gun violence in Brooklyn sort of uh, get mentioned a lot in the same sentence. And uh, so that was sort of, you know, what uh, got me to do that piece uh, there. It's on the, the, the truck is not abandoned. I actually got permission from the owner of the truck. He just collects junk there. It's, uh, it's been there for 20 years. Uh, or long, I think it's been, no, we talked about it, that it's been there as long as the images lived. So it's almost 30 years the truck is there. and. Uh, it still has the same owner, and it still has a lot of junk in it. <laughs> when you guys create your work, do you have a sort of desired, like, emotion you're trying to create, or is it more like in the moment? Uh, so that's an interesting question, an interesting image coming along. 
Uh, that was the first image of the project which we did. Uh, that was when we had no idea what the project was going to be like and what exactly are we going to do. Uh, I, I came to Marta's uh, studio in, uh, in Manhattan with this image saying, I think that's a cool image to start from. Uh, maybe we should do something around that. And then we went for a walk. Just, it's, it's upper Manhattan and we did not, really did not expect the painting anything yet. Uh, but, uh, you know, we, we were walking down the street and Marta was like, look at this spot. Uh, and I loved it. Uh, and, you know, the positioning, the, the gray wall, you can't see it, you can't judge from the image, but it's sort of, it's squeezed in between these tall buildings. Um, it's one of the alleys which we uh, block off in New York. There is no back alleys in New York as such. They all sealed off. So that seal is kind of, um, you know, it's lost between the owners. It's neither, it does not belong to neither building. So we decided just to, to go at it and see how it works and see where we could roll off. And then later we realized that um, Marta brought her friend along. I don't remember her name, but Susanna. But, which she pointed out, that actually that street where we painted was just right next to the um, blocks where the original image was taken. And that was interesting, so that's sort of a serendipity and spontaneous, you know, decisions, you know, uh, which set the, the whole mood for the project and uh, put, you know, put the whole ground of uh, how we're going to go about it. And, um, yeah, so that was a very interesting moment for us, I think. I should, um, if you come to the exhibit, we have a lot of behind the scenes pictures and you can actually see the context of, of these. We tried to match these up so you're sort of losing the people passing by, but when Ernest is painting, he often draws a crowd and they're like a bunch of people passing by. It's not, it's not something quiet that you, well, mostly no street art is. But in this case, we're right down on the street. You're not up high on a lift. And uh, if you, you can see pictures over in the museum of people walking by, baby carriages being, you know, pushed up the, on that other picture. And I think that's kind of interesting. For you guys having worked together, have you learned anything from one another? Has, your, has Martha taught you anything that you've applied to your own work, for example? Uh -oh. <laughs> um, uh, I certainly believe so. It's, it's very hard to point out what exactly, but I wanted to add to what Martha just said. But um, I think what makes her work really special and what makes it interesting and uh, what really attracted me to her work in the first place is that it's never just a documentation. It's not, it's not a documentary of the wall as such. And the reason she's being dragged around the wall to all these festivals uh, and, uh, and being active and, being, uh, and uh, keep on standing out of her work is because uh, I think she really pays much attention to what's going on around and how people react and how people feel towards artwork and how people feel towards artists and, um, and uh, what's the environment and the, the context of the piece um, and the context of the photographs for Marta is more important than the actual finished image of it. Uh, it's not going for the aesthetics of it, it's going for the, for the idea and for the background and for the story and I think that is very much what I'm looking for in my work. So working with Martha was like really inspiring uh, way to see, you know, her angle to it and uh, how she approached her work. Uh, because there's a lot of parallels in our work, even though we work, you know, on different subjects and different uh, situations. Did you see those parallels originally or as you started working closer together, you realized, hey, our work's quite similar? Both. Both. Yeah. Both. Uh, some of them, it's easy to notice right away and, uh, and some of it came out as working together. I would say also I, I really learned to love collaboration, which was not something that I was particularly interested in doing before. Um, I'm a, I've always kind of gone solo. So um, with Ernest, it's, been, it's really been a great experience. Yeah, it's, uh, it's true. I'm not really not fond of collaborations myself. Another artist approached me and asked if, if I want to collaborate together. I know it's very common culture in graffiti. People go paint outside together, people do warm together. And, uh, but for me and uh, from my own perspective, I always get really like sort of confused, you know, on how and what, because uh, my work is very context specific. But because uh, me and Marta, we work in different mediums, I think that just 
blend so much organically that the, yeah, it was not no sort of friction in there. Do you guys want to talk a little bit about this photo? Uh, that was our very like visual photo. <laughs> it was our last picture uh, image of a project I did just before leaving New York. Um, very spontaneous pick. It's Marta's very iconic image. It's not in the street playbook. I think it's uh, the, in the hip hop files. Uh, yeah, it's in the hip hop files. Okay. And um, Marta, throughout the whole project, Marta was saying she really wants to do something on the Lower East Side. And uh, I really agreed with the idea, but it never until the very end, I never, no image came up which would uh, sort of fit there. Uh, to fully represent what's uh, what's our work is about, uh, until I think the most significant part of it uh, of the image which really attracted, uh, which really got me on, is the gate next to it with a massive pool tag on it. It's just like this big pool bombing, and uh, it actually says cool. And I just find it so. Um, it was, a, it was probably one of the first graffitis I ever did, uh, like, meaning in my notebook uh, when you were, like, eight or nine, we would all do the pool because you can draw eyes in it. And um, uh, anyway, so that sort of attracted my, uh, my attention to the wall. And, uh, and then I remembered this image, which is, like, I think it's a definition of cool, uh, this guy right there. <laughs> and um, so, so sort of, you know, that led to it, and then... Uh, and then we bounced it off of Marta, and uh, that was our last piece of the project. Okay. Yeah. Uh, maybe Marta wants to say something about the background of the image, uh, or the kid in there. But maybe you should say what happened, because you saw that they went over it. You oh! Know, it's both, uh, and, and in a couple of, a couple of cases, we've been chastised for going over other people's graffiti. And, and you saw it. I didn't see it on um, Instagram. Some of these. Yeah. So, so I went a bit of a counterculture there, and uh, we did cross quite a few. No, actually, I think that's the first film, uh, first bomb, uh, throw up which we crossed. Before it was just a random tag, uh, but um, apparently, you know, it's uh, it's New York, and that was uh, expected, and. Uh, that was part of the charm of the project. We did not intend that to be permanent. Uh, most of the walls were unarranged, uh, very spontaneous, and they're very accessible locations. So we intended to blend it back in with the graffiti and sort of disappear and remain in the documented through Marta's images of the walls. So this piece went bumped over probably a few months later. And then uh, I saw a recent post, somebody came back and traced the outline of it back on the bombing, which is on top of the painting, which is kind of cute. How long did it take for you to uh, paint every single one, like in individually? How long does it take on average for you to do one? Uh, it's all very different. It depends if it's legal or illegal, if I'm rushing or not, if I have time to think about it. Yeah. Um, if it's illegal, we mostly went for pieces like that, which is single figure. Uh, ground level and easy accessible. So that would take me, I normally take uh, two days. I come in uh, for a couple of hours uh, to put outlines and compositions in. Uh, that's probably one or two hours in the street and then I come back the next day spending maybe three or four hours painting it. Uh, it's um, a lot of people, you know, ask how do I manage get away. Uh, there's one image I regret not showing now. Uh, my first ever visit to New York, I did this little throw up of single figure. And on some of my pieces, I do I do spray can lines for the clothes just to save my time in the street. Really, because I can work on a little portrait for a couple of hours and I just print, spray the rest of the stuff and run. And um, <laughs> so, so what happened? What happened that time? What happened that time was literally the story. So I was standing on top of my bicycle to reach the portrait which I was painting. And I spent um, three or four hours painting the little guy's face and hands, and, and everyone just stopped by and took pictures, and cars would stop and wave at me. There were like maybe four cop cars passing by, and nobody stopped, and <laughs> like, like, I was like, is this New York? You know, like, I, did not, I really did not expect that. But then I thought, all right, it's time to wrap it up, and I need to spray these final details. And, uh, 
and get out of here before I spend too much time there. So I take out the spray can and start shaking it. The truck stops in the middle of the road, starts screaming at me, then there's a traffic jam behind it and everyone's honking and they see cops around the corner. And, um, and that was uh, maybe 30 seconds of me holding a spray can. So I decided in this project, we got to leave spray can away. And, um, and that was no trouble. Yeah, I, I could spend hours and hours in the street just with my little <whistles> brush there. And uh, yeah, so some pieces were a few hours, some pieces yeah. took a few days. Yeah. <coughs> what sort of feedback have you guys got for the project overall? Like, you know, obviously to the internet, it's, it's spread. A lot of people have had the ability to see it from all over the world, but would it? Well, we're here. Yeah. <laughs> so, so we, yeah, <laughs> we're, we're here. Uh, we started running this hashtag uh, replayNYC, uh, which was uh, in just for us to follow um, to follow the you know the development of the project and where it's going. Because a lot of uh, art now is very social media based, and having this artwork in the street, you know, it's, uh, it's not always you're going to go back there and have a look at it. And uh, so yeah, knowing how how people react, how people explore their work, how people. Uh, when it gets bombed over and what happens to it next and if people stole the spray cans yet or not. Um, that was a very interesting uh, process to, to follow, but uh, later led us to uh, another collaboration which we did in Miami, which uh, of the piece you saw here of the Picasso sculpture. And then uh, we ended up here and now we're having a retrospective of the project in the Long Beach Museum of Art. Um, Same very positive yeah. feedback. Yeah. 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 I haven't heard any negative either. So, before I jump into the Q and A, how do you guys see your guys' relationship moving forward and working together? Is there more stuff in the pipeline? Is this kind of like the extent of the project where you guys have curated what essentially your guys' favorite photos, or will we see like an evolution of this? I'm gonna say what Koch said: "Time will tell." Do you remember that? <laughs> <laughs> Very much true. It's uh, we never actually saw an end of it. It's been, it's been left open and it started spontaneously, and we didn't know where it's going to take us. And we we keeping opportunities open, so. We have sorry. We have a few minutes for some questions. Does anyone have anything they want to ask? Or you can just pop down there. I can't really see. Shout it out. Yeah. You said that uh, in the beginning you started the film. At what point did you? Are you using digital now? All the time. All I love time. digital. I started in 2001. I never go back to film. I think it's a cult. <laughs> Hi, I just want to say thank you for being here and thank you for, for sharing and doing this. Um, I'm curious to know what, uh, what has through play, what is revealed through play, as specifically to space. Um, for either one of you, um, if you can reveal that. My work kind of revolves around that, so. Uh, do you, can you... Uh... Be more specific? Yes. Yeah. Um, so my work revolves around like the trickster um, artists and this sort of thing, and there's something that intrinsically happens with space. But I'm curious to know what y'all's experience with space is, either by a specific account or over a period of time, or as an individual who's participating in the environment in this sort of way? Uh, so, my whole process is, uh, is sort of as Marta described as much of the play itself. Uh, I go to the place and I, I have no idea where it's going to end up and what piece I'm going to come up with. Uh, I normally have uh, my archives as uh, one element and the space where I'm working on. Um, visual, aesthetic space of where I'm working on and as well as the background of the space where I'm working on. And then just trying to juggle these around and uh, see where where they cross together. If there is like something in my archives which could lead to something of the story of the background of the area where I'm working on, which leads to whatever it looks like, and just bouncing it backward and forward and trying things. Uh, it's not. It, it's really just uh, an interpretation, my personal interpretation and the vision of how I see it. It's, uh, and I think it's just important to focus on your perception of how you see the space, how you experience the space in the first place, rather than focusing on the image which you want to deliver. And uh, that's sort of stuff which I explore in my, 
and my work. And I see, um, I mentioned before, I see a lot of the parallel in Marta's work as well, because she's never focused on that, on that image image you know it's always a story which comes together with an image and the environment in the image which tells a lot of a lot of that story so uh, i think it's uh, it's manipulating and playing these uh, elements of the image uh, which sort of gets us where we are okay. does anyone else have a question Better. i can try i mean i'm not sure i understand the question but i will i will say that um, for the last 10 years, I've been working in Baltimore, which is my hometown. But I picked a space, 10, 10 block radius, and I decided that I would only take pictures within that space and see how that space changed. And I walked, I didn't have a car or anything, and I made over 200 trips to Baltimore, to that neighborhood, to that space, and just kept walking around and taking pictures and, and watching and seeing what went on within that space, and um, and it, it's a big, been a big project and a very rewarding one. But I'm not sure that answers the question. Is there a question back there? Welcome to Long Beach. Thanks for coming out, um, Ernest. What goes through your mind when you're staring at the wall for a week before you start to paint? Because I was told by another artist who did the same thing in the museum, and I'm not going to mention that artist's name, but you did it in the museum, and you mentioned you did it again with the wall outside. What are you thinking about? It, it's, it's basically how my process is. Uh, it's it just a part of my process. I cannot ever come up with an image. Because if I have a clear idea of what it's going to be, uh, and I go, I go somewhere, it's either going to be two scenarios. I'm going to go and see, now nah, it doesn't work, or it's going to end up looking shit. <laughs> that's the two possible scenarios. Uh, that's, why I do, that's why I avoid the commissions, you know, especially corporate commissions where you have to submit your project, submit your image, and go and deliver the image because it just, I never feel like it works for me. Um, it's, uh, I think it comes, uh, it's not what I, much of what I think, but it's uh, a lot about what I experience, right? So I'll give you like very straightforward uh, thing, which I only realized this morning myself, but I never really catch myself thinking those things. But the first time I went up on the lift, I asked, a, I asked for a lift a week ago, right? So guys at the power are really pissed. I asked for a, week of, for a lift a week ago, and they sit and watch at the wall for a week. And um, <laughs> Uh, no, they, they seem cool, uh, but anyway, um, but that's part of the process, right? So on the first day I get the lift, I, I just take a lift and go up and down. Uh, <laughs> I, that, that's all I did that day. I went up, I touched the wall, and went down. And, and I thought that was a big part of the work. Uh, but what happened in between? <laughs> what happened in between? A guy runs out from the building and. Uh, and says, uh, excuse me, because I asked for a, week, for a lift week earlier, right? So none of the tenants were aware I'm doing this. Uh, so he's like, uh, I don't want to be mean, but you know, like my girlfriend is in the shower, and I, I'm not really sure what you're doing here. <laughs> um, so sort of like the guy you see now on the wall is sort of looking in his window, right? And, uh, um, I, I just realized that. I've been thinking about that guy the whole week looking at the wall. You know? <laughs> um, I never really thought of myself looking in that window, but that's what the image is about. And um, So I think it's much, uh, not much about what I think when I look at the wall and what I think it's going to look like. It's much about what I experience during that time there. You know, this... Uh, like being in a fresh place, new place, which you're not familiar with, like any story is kind of becomes a bit special. And everything I experience, I try just to channel it and sort of and go back to the same elements which I talked before, you know, and browsing my art hacks and seeing what could sort of reflect what I'm what I'm getting from it. I think we have time for one more question. Oh man, there's a bunch of people that want to ask. Do you guys want to just randomly pick somebody? I don't want to. Have the responsibility. Can't see. <laughs> we, can't, we can't see much. I mean, you randomly pick. This guy. You can talk to us after. I took my shirt off. <laughs> this is for Ernest. Uh, as far as street art, do you do you take apprentices and do you show them? Do you teach them? Because you did mention collaboration earlier. 
but does that mean like you would take someone on underneath your wing and teach them things that you know? Uh, not formally, not recently. I, I used to, a lot of my photographs uh, and reference photographs come from the students, uh, from the kids which I used to teach. Uh, when I was in London, I used to run private classes for adults in drawing, um, like live drawing classes, tra classical drawing. And then, uh, and then when I moved to Malaysia, part of my living was uh, teaching my friends' kids um, to paint, paint or draw whatever they would be interested in, and uh, and that would be a lot of playing time involved, you know, because uh, I always try to, you know make them feel like they can have fun with it, like they can do whatever they feel like and just direct them to the mediums which they're attracted to and stuff. And uh, so a lot of them end up my models. And uh, so in that way I do teach a lot, but street art as such I don't really, yeah, I don't really label whatever I teach. Even my, my whenever I teach the classical drawing, it's, it gets my students a bit confused at first, you know, because they, they're not really sure what they're learning, but after I see the interest, that, that they, I see the direction that they're going, you know, and the uh, interest that they're sharing, you know, I can sort of guide them and point things out. But as, as apprentice mastership uh, sort of thing, no, nah, that does not work. I do share studio with a couple of artists back in Malaysia, and. Uh, they come and go, we rotate around, we share experience, we help each other, we share each other's, uh, I don't know, everything, collector spins and stuff. So that's not typical to have an apprentice underneath you, uh, not you per se, but just any artist or muralist in general. I think that's very common. So I think that's very common, but as well I see uh, there is a clash of interest in that relationship. Uh, the apprentice is actually not uh, learning uh, craftsmanship, sort of, as I see in many cases, it's not necessarily a rule. But if someone wants to learn from the artist, they, uh, they want to be artists. And um, so you don't want to uh, hire someone as an assistant who, who actually has the own artistic ambition because you're just going to overkill it. Right? You, you're gonna, you can't have an artist who has creative ambitions and point every single thing which he has to do. And uh, so it either has to be a sort of a collaborative, uh, collective project uh, or, or purely artist-assistant relationship. And I see a lot of people are very actually excited and ambitious about being an assistant, you know, actually about executing the technical parts of the artist's work and not getting creatively involved. So that's, uh, well, I think to every artist is very, has a very individual approach and uh, it varies from artist to artist. Thank you very much. Let's give a round of applause to Ernest. Well, thank you very much, everybody. Thanks for coming by. I hope you guys enjoy the rest of the powwow. Thank you very much.